Hey everybody and welcome to my second of three videos on this, the Nikon D1. In this video, in the first video we talked about what all the buttons are. In this one we're going to talk about what they do and how to use this camera. So the first thing we're going to do, because this camera can't do anything without a battery, and because this battery is almost dead, we're going to change the batteries. So this camera uses Nikon rechargeable battery pack EN4. I don't think Nikon makes these anymore, but there is one company that does, Watson. And um, so I will say when I bought this camera, I bought a Watson battery and the first one I got was dead. It would not hold a charge, so I had to get a second one. Uh, and they, these things are not cheap. It's like 30 bucks for a battery and they last something like 90 shots. So um, the, if you're gonna use this camera and you wanna use it a lot, you're gonna be carrying a bunch of batteries and breaking your back doing that because this is the heaviest camera battery I've ever held. Inside of this, I've taken one of these apart. There are six uh, battery cells inside of this, two, 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 and two, two. Each one is slightly shorter than a AA, but wider. They're about the size of a CR123 battery, but significantly heavier. Plus there's some, some wiring inside of it and everything. Yeah, these are just, these, these are serious batteries that just don't last very long. So now that we've got the battery changed, we're gonna mount and unmount the lens. If you have a lens on the camera already, here's your lens release. You push it in and then you just turn the lens clockwise until you can take it off. That's how you remove a lens from the camera. To mount a different lens, you just grab a different lens, push this in just as a matter of just a habit for me to push that in. Um, drop the lens in place. What you want to do is find this white index dot and your focus mark, and those line up when you place the lens. And then you turn it counter or anti-clockwise until it clicks into place, and that's how you know you've got it mounted properly. For the camera's memory card, it takes CF cards. Now, according to the manual, it can use up to 96 megabyte CF cards. That's enough to hold 27 raw files on it. However, um, experimenting with the stash of old CF cards I have, I was able to get a two gigabyte CF card that worked. It's a Lexar Professional 133X CF card. And uh, this will hold 505 images. And that's definitely preferable to carrying around 25 of these. Um, also, this is significantly faster. This camera, the speed of the CF card makes a bigger difference than on any other camera that I've used. Whether it's a CF card or an SD card or whatever um, that those other cameras use. It takes darn near a minute for a single RAW file to be written to one of these cards. It takes about 15 seconds with the one that's in here right now. And uh, let me tell you that waiting a minute for, to find out whether or not your camera has corrupted your file because you accidentally hit the shutter button twice, that's not enjoyable. That's a long minute. So at any rate, um, so you can change the CF card at any time. The camera does not have to be turned off for you to change the CF card. So if you fill up one of them and you just want to put the other one in without turning the camera off, that's fine. Now you can see I have 504 photos left on this camera. If your CF card can hold more than, I think it's 99 Im images, the number down here will tell you how many photos are left on it. And then up top, the LCD will just say FL. So um, that's your CF cards. Also, one other thing, these old 96 megabyte CF cards are expensive. Um, one of these costs as much as about eight of the cards that I have in there right now. So um, th these are something like, the cheapest I could find these was like seven bucks a piece, which is outrageous on a uh, per byte cost basis. Meanwhile, these sell for a dollar. Um, so I have also tried 256 fi and 512 and one gigabyte memory cards and had them work. I've also had ones of the same size that haven't worked. So I don't know what the rhyme or reason is behind which CF cards work and don't work of the sizes greater than 96 megabytes in this camera. So let's talk a little bit about using a flash with this camera. You have a PC port right here and a, a hot shoe on top of the camera. And you can use 
any modern flash with this camera and your your shutter sync speed is 1 500th of a second. Now what that means is that's the fastest shutter speed you can use with a flash and have it sync and that is very fast. Um, anything slower, uh, 1 250th of a second, a full second, 20 seconds, you can use a flash with anything slower than 1 500th of a second. You just can't go faster. So you can connect it to the hot shoe, you can hold it off camera, and connect it to the PC port. A basic about flash use, and I'm going to make you turn your head sideways here, is that let's say that this lamp represents your flash, okay? If you take a picture and you trigger the flash, the light's going to come out this way, reach your subject, and then bounce back to your lens. And that's going to make your subjects look flat and waxy. You don't want that. It's not a good look for anyone, not even candles. So what you want to do is, if you have your flash on your hot shoe, is get an articulating flash. So you can bounce it off the ceiling, off of a wall, or if you have it connected with a cable, you can hand hold it and then point it. This is the worst possible place for your flash. Something like this would be about second worst. If you're going to mount it on here, really do try to bounce it off of your, your ceiling if you have one. If you're outdoors and you don't have a ceiling, you can get one of those bouncing cards that allows the flash to be uh, redirected after being directed upwards a little bit. And that's an okay stand-in. But the reason for that is if you think about how you see people, you see them outside under the sun, indoors, underneath lights. So when we see people, we are used, or anything for that matter, we're used to seeing it when it's lit from above. And so that seems natural to us, and because it is. So if you set up your flash to mimic natural lighting, which is to say top down, you're going to have a look which is more flattering to your subject and more natural to your viewer's eyes. So let's talk a little bit about metering with this camera. The metering gauge is here on the side of the prism and that's gonna let you choose what type of metering you want. So you push the button in and you can unlock it and then switch between the three options. That is center weighted. That's 3D or matrix metering. We'll talk about that in just a second. And that's going to be spot. So spot metering is a very tiny area in the center of the frame, like about like this big, that contributes to 100% of your metering info. And it's really good for taking a meter reading off what you want to have be properly exposed in the exact mid-range of the zone system, if, you've, if you're familiar with the zone system. Center-weighted will put the majority of your metering data in an area in the center of the frame about like this, and then the rest of the frame will contribute the minority of it. It's either 60-40 or 75-20 on this camera. I'm not sure which. My guess would be 60-40. Now the last one here is matrix or 3D matrix. With this mode, if you have a D lens, you will get 3D matrix metering. Every other lens, you will only get color matrix metering. So with what I have on here right now, I would get color matrix metering. Uh, I do have a D lens, although I guess I didn't bring it with me. At any rate, um, if you're, if, if, the difference is that 3D matrix will look at the depth of the image whereas color matrix will just look at the different colors in the image. Both of them are really advanced and fantastic metering modes. Honestly, uh, looking at images taken in each mode, I can't tell you which one is which because their nearest makes no difference comparable. So um, it's just 3D matrix is a bit more advanced. So the next thing we're going to talk about is how to bracket images with this camera. And here is your bracket button, and we're going to control it over here on this side. If you hold this down using the front command wheel, you can now control your bracketing distance, one stop, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, negative. So you can see over here your frames. Using your, and so negative 2F, uh, negative two frames or positive two frames is the number of frames you're gonna take. And then the distance there, uh, the, the bracketing distance, okay. So three frames means you're going to take three, there we go, and with 
positive or minus negative three frames, or positive three frames like this means you're going to take three frames at 0.7 stops over increments. So 0 0.7, 1.4, 2.1. Three frames here at one stop means you're going to take one under proper exposure, uh, overexposure. Negative two frames is two frames. Um, one of them is going to be a stop under. Okay, so we'll go back to just normal bracketing here at under proper over. Now the rear command dial turns on. The rear command dial actually turns it on. So if you can see that symbol that's flashing right there is your exposure compensation symbol. So the, com the front command dial selects your bracketing amount. The rear command dial is on or off. So that's how you bracket with this. For autofocus point, for flash bracketing, or fl for flash mode, you hold down the flash button, and then you use the rear dial to switch between your modes, okay? So flash with nothing next to it is just your standard rear curtain sink, uh, front curtain sink. Flash with slow is, uh, means you're going to use, I think it's rear curtain sync with slow because it's for slow shutter speeds. Um, so flash with slow next to it is what you would use for slow shutter speeds. Flash with rear next to it is rear curtain sync. We'll talk about that in front curtain sync in a second. Flash with an eyeball is red eye reduction. Red eye reduction with slow shutter sync, and then back to normal. Okay, so normal front curtain sync means when you're, you remember we talked about the flash triggers with the curtain. Front curtain sync is when your first curtain finishes traveling. That moment is when the flash is triggered. Rear curtain sync means that if you take it, that your flash is triggered right before the rear curtain starts its travel. Now if your flash sinking at 1 500th, it does not matter. But if your flash sinking at 10 seconds, it absolutely does. Whether you have your flash triggering now or now. Okay? So let's say that you have your buddy riding down the sidewalk or the street on his bike with a bunch of reflectors on the wheels. And you have some lights set up to reflect the reflectors. If you set up a 10 second exposure, take the exposure, have them ride through it, and then the end of the exposure right now, where your buddy is most of the way through the frame, flash triggers, exposure ends, you'll end up with your buddy illuminated, and then the reflectors on the wheels having created a pattern from being having the lights reflected off of them. So that's one of the ways that rear curtain sync works. Uh, for you as a mode. Red eye reduction will flash the uh, pulse the flash before the exposure to shrink people's pupils to eliminate red eye. Red eye with slow shutter sync is um, will do that and have it be a slow speed shutter. Now slow shutter sync is basically used for slower shutter speeds uh, like for instance when um, if you have somebody sitting in front of a, a city at night, and you want to illuminate the city a little bit with a longer shutter speed, but also have them um, be well illuminated by the flash, you would use slow speed sync with that. There we go, we'll just go with normal as our default use. So let's talk a little bit about the modes in this camera. I'm gonna hold down the mode button and rotate the rear dial through the four different modes. Manual, program, shutter priority, aperture priority. So manual means you are in control of everything. You control the shutter speed, you control the aperture. And if you are right, the camera will take a good picture, and if you are not, the camera will not. Program means the camera does all the thinking for you, and it will pick the best aperture and shutter speed for the given settings based on the program parameters. Does not work with every lens. I don't think it works with the lens I have on right now, for instance, which is just a normal um, AI lens. Shutter priority means you pick the shutter speed and the camera will pick the best aperture for that shutter speed, assuming that there is one that it can use. And then aperture priority is you pick the aperture and then the camera will pick the best shutter speed to give you a proper exposure. EV compensation is this button right here, 
And what you can do is use it to adjust your exposure value manually for a single exposure without bracketing. So let's say that you're out taking a picture at sunset and <clears throat> you're using aperture priority, shutter priority, or program mode, not manual. In manual mode, you would just adjust the shutter speed or aperture yourself. Those three automatic program modes are going to give you a proper exposure, but the sun being in your scene is going to throw that off. So what you might want to do is underexpose a little bit, or overexpose a little bit rather, to get your foreground to be properly exposed instead of just having the sun be properly exposed. You could also use this in settings where, for instance, you and your subject are in shade and then what's behind them is well illuminated. You can adjust your exposure to get better illumination on your subject, even though that might mean blowing out some of the background. All right, so those are the features, so those are the functions that we're gonna talk about in this video. In the third video, we're gonna go through the menu system and talk about what all the menu items are. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing. Thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.